Welcome to another fun and exciting tutorial. My name is Dave Bodie, bringing you this tutorial exclusively for AudioTouchPlus.com. And today we're going to be taking a look at this device right here. This is the Korg Nano Control 2. I believe it's been out for a couple of years. It's just got a little bit of dust on it here. I hope that you can see what's going on here. Normally, you know, shooting something that's black and plastic and prone to sucking up dust particles is a little bit annoying. And I had to use some extra lights here because shooting video of a black piece of plastic is a little bit tricky, but there it is. So this is a little USB powered MIDI control device. And you see it's got eight faders here. Each fader kind of has a channel strip where we have the volume fader, then we have three buttons and those um, can be mapped to anything you like, but uh, they are labeled S, M, and R. So, you know, maybe in a typical DAW application, those would be solo mute and record. And we have a pan knob up here. And over here we have kind of the transport area where we have your play, stop, record, forward, back buttons, and the marker, set marker, forward, back, cycle, track, up and down. That's pretty much it. You know, it, the unit's light, it's tiny and it was pretty cheap too. This I paid $51 for this on Amazon Prime. It's a pretty cheap little unit and um, it feels pretty good. You know, this isn't a product review, but uh, you know, I'll give it a little review. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty solid. There's really not a whole lot of complicated technology in a unit like this. And the reason why I got this is because I've been wanting to have a little bit better control over some of the sounds and some of the libraries that I use, specifically cinematic strings. In that particular library, the patches have mod wheel velocity crossfade, so you can kind of fade up the dynamics. You can control vibrato as well, and that kind of crossfades between the samples. And for strings specifically, that's kind of useful to be able to have uh, touch control when you're kind of arranging things and you need to feel how a line's gonna go, it, it's a little bit easier if you can have, you know, if you're playing a violin line over here and you can crossfade as well as the vibrato. So that's the reason why I got it. But I'm gonna take you through and show you some of the different ways that you can use this. First, we're gonna look at setting it up in a DAW to do kind of standard mixing and arming, muting, soloing, transporting, those kind of things. Then we're gonna check out ways to control some different sounds with some different patches. And then finally, I'm gonna set this up to be used as a controller for mixing some different sounds for a live performance type scenario. So let's jump on in and talk about how to set this up with a DAW and make it work. Now, out of the box, this comes with some drivers which you download and I downloaded the drivers and Got that set up. Now this was a little bit of a trick getting it set up in Windows 7 and I believe various versions of Windows also may have this problem where if you've installed MIDI devices before, there's something like a 10 MIDI device limit. It doesn't mean you can have only 10 MIDI devices installed on your system, but there's something in the registry where once it registers so many MIDI devices, it won't register anymore. I called Korg, they were super helpful, it took less than five minutes and sorted that out. And you know, I'm a pretty tech savvy person. I've built all my own computers. Uh, you know, getting in there in the registry does not scare me at all, but Korg was really helpful and uh, you know, good on them because it's not always when you call tech support and they have actual answers for you. Usually it's, you know, the standard unplug it, plug it back in, but they were really helpful. And uh, because I knew what I was doing, it took no time whatsoever to get it up and running. And now it is working just fine. Like I said, when this thing comes from the factory, it comes set up for MIDI CC. So uh, it's not set up to control a DAW right out of the bat. And this particular unit is capable of some somewhat custom setups for some different DAWs, Pro Tools, Cubase, Logic, and GarageBand. Actually, Logic and GarageBand, you need a special plugin to make work, uh, but it also has one for Sonar, Digital Performer, and Ableton Live. And I use Reaper, which is none of those ones mentioned. Now, they do have one that they say is for other DAWs, but what I found 
doing some tinkering is that the one for sonar can work with Reaper just fine. And looking over the manual, it seems that this uses a very similar protocol or the same protocol as the Mackie control unit, which is much bigger and has a lot more buttons. So this has some of the functionality of that. And because it uses the same protocol, you basically in your DAW, you set it up to make it think it's gonna use the Mackie control device and it just kind of works. There's some little things that you have to do to make this work for that. So uh, one of those is there's a certain kind of button combination depending on the DAW you're going to set it up for. So for sonar, what you do is you press these two buttons and you plug it in and you let go of the buttons and that sets it up for sonar. And that's gonna work for us in Reaper. Now let me fire up Reaper here and I'll show you how you would go about setting that up for the first time in your system. So in Reaper, it's really not too hard to kind of set this up. What you do is you go into the preferences, which is control P or options preferences. And so if you're in here, uh, you scroll down to the bottom in control surfaces and you add a control surface. And you see, we got a list here, different ones. Now, if you pick this one, the Mackie control universal, which is probably what you'd pick on most other DAWs for this little nano control unit. Uh, most of this stuff will work right. There are some quirks though. So a guy named Mr. Clink, I don't, I don't really know his, his real name, but there's a guy in the forums and he's made a custom kind of DLL that uses, it's kind of a reworked, a tweaked up Mackie control universal DLL file. And so I installed that into the plugins folder in Reaper. And it's just a little file, throw it in the folder, boom. So we add that. And then under MIDI input, we add our nano control two. And then MIDI output, we also add the nano control two. Now the reason we add MIDI input and output, I believe, and I'm no MIDI expert here, but certain things like the on off buttons, for instance, if you were to hit play, this play button will illuminate. And then if you hit stop, this play button will stop illuminating. It'll go off. So uh, some control messages are sent here to uh, basically control the LEDs and that kind of stuff. So that's why you would do that. And so now if we hit play, look at that. We are playing. We hit play again, we see it pauses. So what this is doing is it's uh, acting like the play pause button. And if we hit stop, stops. If we hit record, nothing will happen because we don't have anything set up to record. But if we pop open a new channel and look at this, we can hit the record enable button, boom, right there. And now we can hit the record button. Look at that. We are off to the races here, recording absolutely nothing. But that's okay. So we'll hit, just hit stop there. But these other buttons work too. Um, the set marker button does not work in this particular configuration. Some of the other ones it does, this one it doesn't. It's no big deal though, because the set marker button is just M on the keyboard. So you can come in here, pop a whole bunch of markers in, boom. And then these little transport marker buttons will jump to the next marker. So in that way, it does kind of work. And then the forward and back kind of rewind buttons jump a particular amount, I believe the, it's set to jump one measure. So it's not the most refined setup, but it does work. This is a little project that I did for a church this Christmas. It's another performance track. And this is a, a copy of a, a song by the band Gunger called Let There Be. And so they asked me to create this track uh, because there wasn't a background track for it. And so I did, and this is this is basically the rendered out stems. So waves in here, we have drums and you know different instruments and whatnot. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. If you were recording a project and you had a whole bunch of kind of audio tracks like this, you can use this unit here to kind of mix your project and, and get levels and, and solo and, and whatnot. You can see that's working here. Now this is, this thing right here is only eight channels. See, we only got eight, but the way it's programmed, this defaults to channel number one. But if I press this track button, now it's channel nine. If I press it again, it's channel 17. So this basically will jump groups of eight. 
and so you can kind of make adjustments here. Now, if you move multiple faders at the same time, it does work, but it kind of looks a little bit glitchy. You can see what's going on there. It just looks like it's just freaking out. That's because as soon as you move one of these, it selects the channel there. And so if you move a whole bunch of these, it, it likes to just go berserk. So if you were so inclined, you could kind of play this back. And get a mix here of different things. We go up here to the guitars, which are five, uh, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four. You can pan these up, which you actually can't see unless I get up in here. There we go. Cool. So you see the the pan definitely works. Oops. Why? That didn't work so well. So we can kind of pan that, pan this left. We have this in the middle here. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, but you can do that all with your mouse. And sure, you can. In fact, almost all of these functions you can do with your keyboard, except for kind of soloing and muting tracks like this, although you can do this pretty easily by clicking and dragging your mouse like this. Uh, same thing to unmute them and um, mute them as well. And I believe you can do the same with chord enable. Probably this would be useful for more of a console kind of recording background, you know, moving faders. They might be more comfortable with that. For me personally, um, I don't do that. Uh, any mix automation that I do, I like to draw in with an envelope. I just, that's kind of my workflow, you know, and that's just what works for me. But if you're the kind of person who feels more comfortable with some faders, getting in there and doing your thing, you know, this could be right up your alley. Now you can also set this up really easily to automate something like these nasty sounding guitars. And we go in here and click this little track envelope automation and we say, yeah, throw up a volume. That's good. How about this one? Throw up a volume. We'll also set it to arm and we'll set it to right. And we'll set this one to right. Now what we have to do, go back, we'll set this to track one. And then, so now we're at nine. So it's nine, 10, 11. Oh, here we go. Good. I know that these are the right tracks because they're soloed. And so if we go to track one, you can see all the solo lights go out and as soon as we go back to 9 through 16 these two solo lights are lit up so there you go now if we go ahead and play this Cool. You can see what that did there. It basically drew in the automation for us. And that could be really helpful if you needed to, let's say, ride a vocal throughout a song and it, you know, it was too annoying to get in here and, and draw the volume envelopes and you just want to do it by ear. You just set up one track to write and, you know, you just kind of ride it out. And then you can come back in here and you can take your little points here and you can right click on them. Maybe make this a little bit nicer looking and say set default envelope point shape to Bezier. And then we'll select these and set shape for selected points to Bezier. Now we can come in here one more time. We're going to right click and then we can say reduce number of points. Now you see in this little section here, we have 197 points. What we can do is pull this little slider down. Boom. Look at this. Gets rid of a lot of that garbage, maybe a little jitter little micro movements that maybe we didn't want. And uh, you know, you can find a spot that, that gets most of them in there. You can see like maybe right, right there. And then you can see, let me get you down here. You can see that this one here has a good bit less number of points and it's probably a little bit smoother overall. And you can come in here and, and tweak these up to your heart's content. But that kind of shows you how you can set this up 
in a DAW for doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, depending on what you're working on, this can be really helpful for you to say if you have to if you have to loop a whole bunch of times and you just have to you bounce around between a couple of markers. You know, you set up your couple of markers if you're trying to hammer out a, a particular par or um, you know that kind of thing. It all kind of depends on what you're used to. But for these faders and knobs and stuff, uh, that is a little bit more difficult to program into the keyboard. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's impossible. So that kind of gives you an overview of kind of setting this up for your DAW. What we looked at in this video is how to set it up in Reaper, but that setting it up like this with this particular Korg Nano Control 2 is going to be pretty similar for other DAWs. They all will need to use that Mackie control unit protocol for the control surface. And then you can have kind of similar functionality, get in there and mix your tracks. This probably would work pretty good if you were using a lot of audio tracks. I tend to use a lot of plugins with MIDI stuff. And so, you know, if you have a project that's a hundred or so tracks or 150 tracks, using this to, to mix might be useful for parts of it. Uh, but it also can get confusing if you're kind of pulling down MIDI faders or, you know, it just really depends on your, on your setup. So I hope you found that kind of useful in the next part of the tutorial. We're going to look at how to set this up to do some MIDI learn functions. And we're going to get into some customizations in setting up some parameters for specific sound patches. And we're also going to look at how to set up kind of a live performance situation where you get in here and kind of mix between some sounds and have some controls over some different effects. We're going to check all that out in the next tutorial. So join me then. And uh, thanks so much for watching.